Welcome to the House of God International Headquarters, located in Lexington, Kentucky. Thank you for tuning in to our broadcast today. We know that you will be blessed. To learn more about the House of God, visit us online at www.houseofgod.org. Be blessed. Uh, greetings to all of you today. So happy. Uh, God's blessed us to be together once again. I do honor his name today and thank God for all of his mercy and all of his grace and all of his love. Thank him for all of his concern for us each and every day. And we honor him and we want to give honor to all of you that are sharing with us today, our House of God members that are that are on with us today. We appreciate your time so much. You do have choices. I know you have choices. Uh, many other uh, presentations that you could share. So we thank you for being with us today. Uh, our friends and visitors that find themselves viewing with us, we thank you so much for your time and your interest. You have a lot of options in terms of uh, media today. So we thank you for sharing. We hope that these uh, presentations are beneficial to you. I want to open today again by thanking all of you that that supported our virtual convocation this year. We appreciate you so much. We also thank those of you that worked so hard to make the convocation, our virtual convocation, a success to our program committee and to the uh, financial department of the church, to all of you that, that helped with technology and helped us uh, have the presentation that we did. We thank you so much for that. Uh, we're not consummate professionals at this, but we're learning along the way. So I do appreciate you being patient with us as we go through this process. Uh, I want to thank all of you for your contributions to the church. Uh, those of you that made your financial contributions, your reports and that, uh, we thank you so very much. In times like these, uh, when uh, patterns are being altered and attendance is possibly not what it once was. Some of you may not be having in-person uh, services as well. So we thank you so much for your efforts on behalf of the church. It is through your uh, very generous contributions and donations uh, that keep us viable. So we thank you for that. A special thank you to our finance department who does an excellent job in steering and providing format for you to make your uh, contributions electronically and, and to be sure that you are accessing the proper forms of communication for making contributions. So finance department, we thank you, all of you uh, that make uh, this effort during these difficult times easier for all of us. We appreciate you so much. I also want to make this additional announcement uh, concerning the remainder of 2021, uh, the remaining months of 2021, uh, normally uh, uh, compose, uh, is composed of two national meetings. That is our minister's conference that takes place uh, usually in October, and our youth conference, which is one that we all enjoy and support. Those conferences this year, because of COVID-19, will not be in-person conferences. Uh, it's just uh, because of the virus and the trending around the country and the unsettled state of our vaccination process, we just feel that it would not be prudent to try to have you come to the National Temple for these national meetings. And I, I speak that in particular of our youth conference. House of God is blessed to have a a lot of young people that love the church very much and, and travel, fill up our sanctuary, our national uh, conference sanctuary every year with their presence at the annual youth conference. Uh, with that in mind, we're not going to have in-person conference this year and, and put our young people in the, the exposure of uh, possibly contracting uh, COVID-19 or one of the variants. So for the balance of this year, we will not be having any in-person convocations, national uh, conferences for our ministers or for our youth. However, we're praying 
that come March, when it's time for our annual women's conference, that we will be able to have that conference in person. We're looking forward to that in 2022. So uh, we're going to be, be making plans for an in-person women's conference this spring uh, in 2022. But meanwhile, we've suspended all of the remaining conferences for 2021. And that, of course, being our minister's conference and our annual youth conference. So keep those announcements in mind. We'll be sharing more information with you concerning uh, our 2022 uh, uh, year. But we're looking forward to being in person. Not only for that, but we're praying to God that our country will come together. Uh, vaccinations will increase. Uh, people will be more adherent to uh, our protocols by the CDC and that the uh, FDA will, will also uh, will have approved vaccinations for our children under 12 years old. Please remember, that's an influence in us not having in-person uh, national meetings as well. We have a population of young people that, that are not yet vaccinated, those that are under 12 years old. We want to take care of them. We want to take care of all of you. I hope that you will uh, uh, bear with us as we go through this. I know that some of you are having local in-person um, meetings and services each week. Uh, that, that's fine if you can do them safely. But for our national conferences where we have to travel, we have to have in-house in dining, and all of those things that are part of it, it's just not safe for us to do that at this time. So bear with us. Uh, we're praying that God will guide all of us, not only us, but our politicians who are grappling with this, our school systems who are grappling with these problems related uh, to, our, to the virus and, and in-person classrooms and all of that. Uh, we just want to be sure that best we can to keep you safe. So keep those announcements in mind. We'll have other announcements forthcoming. We have state meetings that are that are scheduled for November and that. I understand that as well. We'll be making announcements on those as well. Some of our areas of the country are more safe than others. Some of our, our meeting places, uh, you know, are not as populated. So we'll have some information to share with you on that in the very uh, immediate future. Meanwhile, keep in mind what we've already shared with you concerning our national conferences. Now we're excited to be back with you uh, for our weekly presentation. Uh, for several months, we had an ongoing series dealing with that period of time uh, in the development of the church after the ascension of Jesus Christ, when he went back to heaven, uh, we, we were looking at the development of the church uh, during that period. That's a critical time uh, during the development of the church. Uh, Jesus, upon uh, his ascension, before his ascension, he made some very profound statements concerning what would happen uh, after the Holy Ghost had come and that he said that uh, you would have power, the church would have power, and we would be witnesses of him uh, in virtually around the world. He mentioned some great geographical areas uh, in, in the part of the world where he was, but we know that he empowered the church through the Holy Ghost, that we would be witnesses of him all over the world. So we want to continue to follow. We follow the developments of the church uh, starting at the day of Pentecost when all of the, the uh, Jews from around the world were ascended at Jerusalem for the celebration of the Feast of Weeks or the Pentecost as we know it today. And when the Holy Spirit uh, came down and, and empowered the church, we witnessed that and then we witnessed something else. We witnessed the momentum that the church took on during that time. There were thousands of people uh, that were receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, miracles were performed in Jerusalem. Miracles were performed by the apostles uh, as, as, as they encountered people. We witnessed and we talked about all of that. 
we talked about what happened with with Peter and John and 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 the apostles during that time. We also we also witnessed real opposition. I mean, real time opposition to the teaching and preaching of Jesus Christ. We witnessed how the the uh, church was being challenged by the ruling class of religious leaders in the in the the, the, the church, uh, the Jewish community at that time uh, was very much opposed to the teaching of Jesus Christ, and there was a great persecution of those that taught and preached Jesus Christ. You remember uh, the incarceration and threats that Peter and John experienced uh, from the priest and, and the, the leaders of the, the Jewish community at that time. There was a lot of opposition, a lot of opposition. Uh, they were virtually threatened against teaching and preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. You also remember how that uh, Christ, uh, through the working of the Holy Ghost, because remember, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Uh, I will be with you always through the spirit of the Holy Ghost. He made that promise to them. And, he, and we've watched how faithful Christ has been to the development of the church in these early days when they were tried, when they were persecuted, when they were threatened, when, when, when they were incarcerated, he came to their aid. And there, there was a, a deacon by the name of Stevens who, who was the first mortar, the first mortar to lose his life because of the preaching and teaching of Jesus Christ. So we want to continue to follow that and see how uh, that God continues to protect, defend the development of the church in face of all opposition. You remember that Saul was one of those that was a great, great uh, persecutor of the church, believed in God, understood the commandments, understood the laws of God, understood the ordinances of God, but was very adverse to the name of Jesus Christ and all of those that supported Jesus Christ and, and were, were part of that movement. That, that was one of the strongest movements in the Bible. We take it for granted today there's a church on every corner in most communities and most cities. You have churches everywhere. They have Pentecostal churches. They are Baptist churches. They are Methodist churches. All these churches teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. They're not all the same. Many of them don't observe the Sabbath or the feast days, but they certainly are advocates of Jesus Christ. That name took the religious world by storm, but it was not without opposition. And all of us today that have the freedom of religion, the freedom to teach and preach in the name of Jesus. We are so casual with it. We take it so much for granted. But there was a time when that name was greatly opposed to in the early days of the development of the church. Interestingly enough, most of that opposition, at least in the early days, came from the religious groups, principally the, 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 the Sanhedrin leaders and those that were very opposed to the name of Jesus Christ. That's where it came from. It came from the religious side. There was not as much persecution from the political side or the government side in the development of the church as it was from the religious side. And that's interesting to look at because on, on the government side, on the government side, uh, many times they didn't want anything to do with the religious fights that some of these different sects were having. So they stood back. 
But then came the time, and we've been following. This is why I encourage you to read the book of the Acts of the Apostles. It's exactly what the name implies, the Acts of the Apostles. You need to read that to have a greater appreciation for what you have today and what I have today in terms of uh, freedom to teach Jesus Christ. We also need to look at it uh, from the secular side. And that's where I want to start today in Acts, in Acts chapter 12. The church had received much opposition from the religious side. But at that point, they had not received a lot of opposition from the governmental side or the political side. But we find the account in Acts chapter 12, and everything we've been reading before had to do with religious persecution from religious people, religious opposition. But in Acts chapter 12, we find an introduction to persecution that's now coming from the government. And that's a whole different challenge. Yes, Stephen's lost his life. The religious opposition stoned him. Stoned him to death. Yes, Peter and John and those placed in jail came, or, or at least came before the religious leaders. I won't say placed in jail at this point. But were interrogated and threatened by the religious leaders of the day. But at this point in Acts, this is the first time that the church has received pressure from the political side, the governmental side of leadership. And you read the account, and I hope that you will read it, I'm going to spend some time with this because I think this is really important. We don't have the appreciation that we should have for the religious freedom that we have in this country. Much of the opposition that you receive in your congregation or you receive from what you teach many times comes from the religious world. It doesn't come from your local government. It doesn't come from your state government. It doesn't come from your national government. It comes from other religious people that don't see the Bible as you see it. Whether it's the observance of the Sabbath, whether it's the observance of the Lord's feast days, whether it's the teaching of, of certain biblical or certain theological positions, the government isn't giving you the problem. Other religious groups are. Some say, well, you know, I don't see the relevance of the Sabbath. So you may get a hard time from certain religious leaders in your community. Or whether what you eat and what you don't eat. What you drink and what you don't drink. What you wear and what you don't wear. The opposition is not coming from the government. We have something that's called in our country separation of church and state. I don't know the, how much appreciation we have for that. We don't have state laws, national laws, that govern the day in which you wish it. We all should be raising our hands and saying, thank you, Lord, for that. We don't have government saying that we all must be Pentecostal. We must all must all be Sabbath observers. We must all observe Sunday. We must all preach and teach the same thing. The government isn't in that business. And thank God it isn't. But there are religious leaders that have very strong dogma in terms of what is what to preach and what to say. So the church doesn't face that. But the incident that we're going to talk about today in Acts chapter 12 
is where the government stepped in and involved itself in religious persecution. In religious persecution. It was not the Jews. It was not those that were part of the religious teaching of the day. It was the government. And in Acts chapter 12, it introduces persecution that came from the Roman government. The Roman government. Under the leadership and authority of Herod Agrippa, the grandson of Herod the Great, who was the one that was on the throne when Jesus was crucified. It was Herod the Great. I'll take a moment with that because many times we read the Bible and all we say is Herod. Is Herod. But there was a whole succession of Herods that identified in the Bible. There was Herod the Great. There was Herod Agrippa the First. There was Herod Antipas. There was Herod the second. And they all were rulers. But they ruled in different dispensations or different time periods. So Herod the Great is now has now died. He was the one that was on the throne when Jesus was interrogated by Pilate. He's dead. But in the Acts of the Apostles where we're reading, his grandson is now the one on the throne, Herod Agrippa the first. So what he did, and history is not certain, and biblical scholarship is not certain of what caused him to take an adverse approach with the church. But the results of that is devastating. It's devastating. So I want to read just a little bit for you uh, on that because I think it's worth taking a note to. In Acts chapter 12, uh, I'll read probably, I'll be reading the first four verses of Acts chapter 12, speaking about what Herod Agrippa is now doing to the church. It says, Now about that time, Herod, the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because that he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quadrants of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring forth to the people. This is devastating. And, and let me just share this while we're reading this. The application of the word Easter here, it's the only time you find it in the Bible. And the application here really is for Passover. You've got to remember that this took place during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or the Bible identifies days of unleavened bread. 
The church did not observe Easter. The apostles did not observe Easter. What they observed was Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the the accurate word here should be Passover rather than Easter. It happened during translation or happened how they depicted it. But Peter, John, James, and those did not observe Easter. It was Passover. I want to make that point. And some translations will make that notation. But I want to say that in case you're watching or you're listening to me and you're not familiar with this. Um, It really is the time of Passover. But what we're looking at here is when Herod Agrippa I sought, placed his hand to vex the church. What does that mean? Have you ever thought about what that means? The Bible doesn't give you a lot of details here. It really doesn't. Acts doesn't give you a lot there. And when you look at historical references, uh, some of it's speculation as to what that might have been. What we do know is that the favor that the church had prior to this now is changing. The preaching and the teaching is now being challenged. Those that do the preaching and teaching are now finding themselves under persecution, under opposition. And this opposition is not coming from the religious groups, although it has not ceased. But now there's opposition from the political governmental side. The language that's used in Acts is that the king stretched forth his hands to vet aggravate the church certain of the church what does that mean it can mean a lot of things it can mean a lot of things there may be opposition to religious religious observances there may be opposition to Sabbath observance there may be opposition to temple worship there may be opposition to meeting in the synagogues. There may be opposition to the observance of feast days. There may be opposition to what is classified as clean and unclean eating. So we don't know what that opposition was, but it was designed to vex, irritate the people of God. In verse 2, and I wish the Bible gave us more information on James. It does not. It does not. In all likelihood, and the Bible doesn't say it, so I can't say it. But in all likelihood, James was beheaded. Does the Bible say it? No, it doesn't. But it does say this. And this is speaking of Herod Agrippa in his vexing the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that he did it himself. He gave the command for his soldiers, the executors, to kill James. You've got to remember that John the Baptist was beheaded. Beheaded, all probability, with the sword. It's a custom. It's a form of capital punishment. It's a form of execution. 
And though the Bible doesn't say beheaded, but based on customs and trends and traditions, in all likelihood, James was beheaded. Now what's interesting with this is the impact that this has on the church. We don't read that directly. And I think we don't read it directly because we don't know the backdrop, the circumstances surrounding Herod's opposition to James. Was it done secretly? Or was it done publicly? We don't know. Was he incarcerated for a period of time? We don't know. Was there a trial of James? We don't know. So because we don't know these things, it gives rise to the fact since the things were not published, that the killing of James may have been more in a clandestine way than in a public way, and then information was made known to the people. You say, well, why do you say that? When you look at what happened with Peter's incarceration that everybody knew and how the people responded, there was not that kind of response to James. He was no less beloved and no less known than Peter. James was there on the day of Pentecost was one of those who received the Holy Ghost, was one of those that witnessed the power of the Holy Ghost, was one of those that was along there with Peter with that very famous sermon. So he was no less important. But we don't find description of what happened. Let me make some associations. James was the brother of John. They were the sons of Zebedee. Read that in Matthew chapter 4. They were fishermen. They became disciples of Jesus Christ. When he came along, and gave them the challenge to follow him. The Bible declares they, they, they dropped their nets. They became fishermen. Fishers of men. They were natural fishers. They were blood brothers. And both of them became disciples, and ultimately apostles of Jesus Christ. Not only was James a disciple and an apostle of Jesus Christ, he was also one of those insider disciples. Peter John, James, Andrew. So he was one of the lead disciples. So just through reasoning, it seems as though Herod Agrippa is setting out to vex the church by killing one of its leaders, one of its spokespersons, 
one of those that walk closely with Jesus Christ. You must remember that when Christ was transfigured on the mountain, James was one of those that was with him. James, John, Peter, Andrew saw something that others didn't see. The transfiguration of Jesus Christ. James was an important part of the plan of salvation, the teaching of the gospel. He and his brother were named by Jesus. He called them the sons of thunder. Why would he call them sons of thunder? There was something about those brothers that was powerful in ministry, powerful in delivery, powerful in the mission, powerful teachers and preachers. So when Herod reached out, and the, and the reason I'm taking some time with this today is because we read over this verse like, yeah, he, he killed James. But there was purpose behind killing James. It was silencing one of the disciples, one of the voices, one of the sons of thunder. It was impactful to the movement. Can you imagine the impact that it had on his brother John? Who was also one of the close disciples of Jesus Christ. So when the Bible says that Herod put his, stretched his hand to vex the church. Took James, one of the pillars. Took James, one of the strong advocates. Took James. One of the strong preachers took James, who was one of the insiders with Christ, saw him transfigured before his eyes. Saw him speaking to Moses, Elijah. Saw him there. One of the ones that Jesus said, don't tell the story until after my death. Keep it close to the vest. James was one of those that kept it close to the vest, pondered what Jesus said. Now, Herod Agrippa was taken, one of the strong disciples, and killed him. I want you to see this. Because when the church developed, it was these 12 men. It was these disciples, now apostles. But each one of them had a role. James's role was one of those strong voices. One of the strong voices for promotion of the name of Jesus. Stephen's was not an apostle. Stevens was a disciple. Stevens was not a preacher as such. His death led to the spreading of the word of God. But can you imagine James's death? What that meant to the movement. When we look at this, I, I take a moment with it because we read over things so quickly in the Bible and we don't put background behind it and we don't put space behind it. It's been years at this point since the death of Stephen's. And Stephen's death, that's when the disbursement started. That's when people started to scatter. That's when people became fearful. That's when people went to the hills and went to surrounding uh, uh, cities in fear. That was fear of the Jews. But now the government's getting involved, touching the church. One of the things that I think is important to remember, 
Herod was also influenced by the Jews because he watched them. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. And because he saw, speaking of Herod, and because he saw it pleased the Jews. What he did to James pleased the Jews. What did the Jews think at this point? Hey, there's one less, there's one less teacher of Jesus Christ. There's one left out there that opposes us. There's one le less person that we have to put up with. He's out of the way now. Herod Agrippa saw that. He sensed that. It empowered him. It emboldened him. So what does he do? What does he do? He proceeded further to take Peter also. This is clearly a strike at the church. It's a strike at the church being influenced by the opposition from the religious leaders of the day. It's clearly, it's clearly. Now, there are probably some other things there too. Herod very well may, Herod Agrippa very well may be thinking that this name of Jesus is a threat to him. Because remember, when Jesus was interrogated, one of the questions were asked, are you the king of the Jews? King? Leader? Royalty? Hey, that's a threat. So Agrippa, Herod Agrippa, very well may have seen the name of Jesus as a threat to his leadership. And he knew that doing this, it would be pleasing to the Jews. He watched them. What's the reaction? He's vexing the church. Let me show you. A critical part here. Of vexation. To them. This was done. This was done during the days of unleavened bread. That is like an abomination. It's like sacrilegious that you would reach into the church and kill one of its leaders during the days of unleavened bread or Passover. That was not by accident. It was not by accident. It was planned to be done during the feast. Who's James? James is one of those that sat around the table with Jesus in Matthew 20, 26. In Luke chapter 22. He was one of those around the table. He was one of those that took the body and blood of Christ. He was there when it was instituted. What a vexation that is. For the apostles. That this pagan ruler. Would reach out. And touch one of their own. During the days. Of unleavened bread. Right after they have shared the body and blood of Christ. Right after they've done what Jesus told them to do. In sharing the blood of Jesus Christ. And his body that's broken. Right during that holy season. One of their own. Is killed. With the sword. Herod knew what he was doing. And he knew that this would vex the church and please the Jews. It would vex the church and please the Jews. 
They remember. And the disciples remember. Jesus is just doing remembrance of me. This is my blood. The New Testament. Shed for you. Shed for many. For remission of sins. And this leader has the nerve to be that sinister and that diabolical to kill one of the disciples or one of the apostles. So there's a lot to this, and I, I want to take, take, take a minute with it because I think it's important. So what does he do in verse 4? And we had apprehended him, we put him in prison, delivered him uh, to four quadrants of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. What does that mean? What does that mean? After Passover, after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, I'm going to bring him before the people. Why is that? It was for the same reason. It was for the same reason that at the crucifixion of Jesus, which took place right at Passover, they could not desecrate a holy day. So what, what happens here? Herod is as crafty as he can be. I've got to bring him forth after the feast. Because if I bring him at the feast, hallelujah, if I bring him on a holy day, there's going to be an uprising of the Jews. I don't want to lose their favor. I don't care about the church. What I care about right now is keeping their favor. And when he saw that it pleased them, what he's done, it empowered him to do more. Now I will take the next leader. I'll take the number one leader. I'll take the one that's causing all the problem. I will take him and after Passover. What is he going to do? He's going to bring him forth to the people. Do you know what that means? He doesn't say it here, but it's implied. I'm going to kill him by the sword too. I'm going to execute him too. I'm going to execute him as well. I see how it worked. With James, the Jews love it. I see how it worked with them. So I'm going to do the same thing. But I've got to wait till the feast is over. I share this with you. This is the environment in which the church was born. It was born in this environment. Opposition on two fronts. Opposition from the religious leaders of the day. Opposition from the government. And I want you to see it. Because we, we have it so good today. We have it so easy today. Yes, we have opposition. Sometimes opposition comes from other religious leaders. Other religious denominations. Other religious groups. People that don't believe like you believe. And it becomes a point of contention. But the area where we don't have it is in the church. Not yet. It's coming. But not yet. Not yet. So the legislatures make laws. Some of those laws, some of those laws are in direct opposition to the Bible. I understand that. But we don't have somebody standing on your doorstep saying that you can't praise God, that you can't use the holy book, that you can't be a Sabbath observer. That you can't teach those things. And if you do, we're going to kill you. That's what Herod did. That's what Herod did. That's why this is so important. 
This is why it's important for us as believers in Jesus Christ to appreciate all the more the freedom and rights that we have to assemble and to praise God. Go back to your sanctuary and appreciate God more every day. Go back to your temple, whatever you call your house of worship. And celebrate God for the freedom that you have to operate without the threat of government closing your doors, changing your direction. In verse 5, and this is as far as I'm going today because there's a lot here, and I want to take my time with this to help us see what opposition the church was born in. While all of this was going on, after the death of James, after the grief of his brother, yes, his brother grieved, the Bible doesn't say it, but if you have a family member that you're close to, when they die, you grieve. John felt what happened. But in verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. I wonder why that was so important. I'll tell you why that was so important. The people understood. If Herod Agrippa killed James, he's now taken Peter, he'll kill Peter too. And that's the government. And there's not anything we can do about that. But the one thing we can do is pray. So I'm going to stop there at verse 5 because I think this... Uh, this deserves attention as well when we take a look at Peter. But I wanted to take the time today with James and, and give you some backdrop and support for understanding the importance of this and the, the, the conspiracy, if you will, against the church to take one of its beloved foundation and leader in the person of James. God bless you today. I hope this has been meaningful. I hope it will just stimulate you to do your own independent reading and research and to have a greater appreciation of James. I encourage you to go back and, and look at his history. Look at his history in the Bible. He was a significant leader and disciple of Jesus Christ. God bless all of you today. Let us pray. Father and eternal God, we're so thankful today for your blessings and your mercy. Thank you for your goodness and thank you for all the things that you do for us each and every day. And as we look at the development of the church and we look at the persecution, not only from religious leaders, but also from political leaders, but through all of that, God, you have made a way from the very beginning for the, for, for the preservation of your church. We thank you, God, for the power of the Holy Ghost that interacts and sustains us as a body of believers. Thank you for these examples in Scripture. I pray, God, that you will cause all of us to have a greater appreciation for what we have today. These prayers I pray in Jesus' name. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless all of you.